All right, lots of ground to cover. We've got a lot of scripture. My goodness, I'm already running out of time. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2. Lots of scripture today, so I need you to put your listening ears on, class. Um, and uh, write fast. And lots and lots of scripture today. I'm going to read three scriptures out the gate because I want to show you a pattern uh, before we get into some of the details. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. And uh, just hang with me, bro, until we get through all three of these pieces of scripture. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's every shot household. household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Listen to some of these distinctions that are being made because we're going to talk about them. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 through to 16, just a few chapters later, Paul writing once again, and he says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry and to build up the body, every shout body, of Christ until we reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head Christ from him, the whole body, every shout body, body. fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of everybody shout body. For building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Jesus speaking says this, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build, come on, everybody shout, my church. My church. And the gates of hell will not prevail yeah. against it. Yeah. Today, as we continue on in our series, Tethered, I want to speak to you from this subject today, the church, more than a building. As we look at the beauty, diversity, mission, and mandate of this thing called church, oh Jesus, we need you today. Your presence is here. We know that. And so I pray today that your word as seed, as you said it is, would be cast upon the soft soil of our hearts today, that it would take root, it'd sink in, it would grow, it would flourish, and we'd become everything that you've called us to be. God, I pray that you would change minds today, change hearts today, convict us today, challenge us today. God, move us in a new direction today as we are challenged by your word. And may your church, locally and globally, be strengthened today. We love you and we worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, and the church shouted. Amen. Show of hands. Have you ever been somewhere and upon arriving to that place, you needed clarification as to what type of place it was? Come on, how many of you have been there before? All right, I, I don't know if you've ever had this experience before, but Eric and I being foodies, we love going to, to different restaurants, but have you ever been to a restaurant b before? And then upon looking at the menu, you were confused at what type of restaurant you were at? Here's my issue with the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Come on, can I get an amen in church today? Listen, cheese, if you're watching Cheesecake Factory, pick a lane, because I'm struggling with the menu. I, I don't know if it's cheesy grits or Mongolian beef, right? Like, which one, how many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you know that your experience at the Cheesecake Factory is seven hours long because three of those hours are reading the menu? <laughs> right? That's why in and out Let's go, somebody. <laughs> It's not hard. Have you ever noticed that when you drive through a drive through in and out, they don't even talk to you anymore. They just show you the list. There's four things. They're like, choose. You don't have much, many options, but let's get it done. We're getting this line moving. They have a lane and, and they stay in it. But I find it fascinating that I can go to the Cheesecake Factory and I'm somewhat confused. I don't even know what to do with the place while I'm there. And I believe that is what has happened with the church. There is great confusion as to what it is what it should be, what it needs to be, and especially now, its role within the local city and the world at large. Yes. 
Now, I would say, let's just go, go for it. If you're, if you're a guest with us today, I'm gonna just go straight in on this stuff, all right? So come back next week. Actually, let me pause on that one. Um, next week, we're, we're getting into the really heavy topics. So next week, we're gonna, we're gonna start the marriage conversation. But I wanna warn you in advance, it's not seven keys to a great marriage marriage conversation. We're not gonna be talking about communication. We're not gonna be talking about any of those things. We're actually gonna be talking about the theology of marriage. And from, that, from this is actually where we start to understand identity, yes. what God meant through marriage. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you are single in this place, you wanna be here next weekend because this message is for you, yes. okay? If you're struggling in your sexuality, this message is for you. If you're confused about some of these things, this message is for you. It's going to be a very, very important message. Parents, I need to say this too. I'm wasting time on this stuff, but I need to say this. Parents, we have a phenomenal kids ministry. Come on, somebody. So if you are not comfortable, like for, for sixth grade and up, it's gonna be fine, I think. Um, seventh, eighth grade and up, it's gonna be fine, I think. Um, but if you haven't had a conversation about some of these things with your kiddos, uh, take advantage of our kids' ministry um, because we're gonna be, over the next probably three, four weeks, we're gonna be really into some stuff. Sound good? Yep. All right, back to, back to this. There are a few main reasons for general confusion concerning the church. Here's the first one. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but I wanna acknowledge them. Both a historical and modern mishandling of the church. Now, this is where we see abuse and scandal mark the church. We've seen this over the past few years, especially, both past and present. And I believe that if we're gonna speak about the church, the subject of the church, we must acknowledge this fact to not do so as burying our heads in the sand and not creating a fair, fair picture. We can't dismiss it or gloss over it. So one of the reasons that some of us harbor confusion about the church is because there is a historical and modern mishandling of the power of the authority um, that, that is found within the church. The second reason that I see confusion about the church is because there's lack of knowledge and biblical understanding about the church. Generally speaking, there's a lot of people that simply don't know about the church, especially from a biblical perspective. And I wanna say this, where people lack knowledge and understanding, confusion takes place. Here's the third reason we see confusion about the church is because of misplaced and unrealized expectations of the church. A very common theme that I've found when it comes to the confusion surrounding the church is where the issue of expectation is concerned. If you have journals, by the way, we're at page 132. 132 in your journal, this guy right here. There are a lot of people who have had expectations of the church as they've come in and they were, they were let down. But I wanna say this as a caveat, many of those expectations were misplaced and ones that it should have never been applied. And we see this happen, come on, in all types of relationships, the church included. Here's the last reason that we see confusion about the church is a general dislike or disagreement with the idea of church. Once again, I'm being simplistic with these, with these categories, but it's a pretty broad realization here. This is the idea that many are confused concerning the church because they simply don't like the idea of church. There tends to be more of an independent and isolated desire where this view is held. Now I realize that there are more categories, views, and experiences potentially even represented in this, in this house today. But when it comes to the broadest and most relevant, these all hold true. Now, I'm not gonna be able to address each of these at length, but I do hope as we continue to work through this message today, each will be, be addressed one way or another. My goal today, my goal today is to bring clarity concerning the church, both universally and locally. Although most of our work today will be more directed towards the local church, the local context of church. My goal today is to bring back a love and honor for the church even with its idiosyncrasies, even with its faults, even with its weirdness, even with its awkwardness, I wanna go on record to say this, I love the church. That's my bias this morning, okay? It was St. Boniface who said, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. So what, or, or better, who is the church? 
Well, let's first look at our statement of faith regarding the church found in our journals. We believe there is one holy, universal, and apostolic church, which is the body of Christ and to which all true believers belong. The church's calling is to worship God forever and to serve God in the world. There is a spiritual unity of all believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very simplistic view. Now this, this holy and universal church finds its location in smaller localized churches. But we are all part of the church in Africa that I was talking about today. And the church in Indonesia who's meeting right now. And the church in China who's meeting underground right now. And the church in Germany. And the church in Atlanta. And the church in NYC. And the, y'all see what I'm talking about. So one big church comprised of believers, but it's being fleshed out locally in different places and spaces with different contexts. Now, quoting the handbook, uh, quoting from the Moody Handbook of Theology, the English word church translates the Greek word ekklesia, which is derived from ek meaning out of and kaleo, which means to call. Hence, the church is a called out group. This is important. Ecclesia appears 114 times in the New Testament, three times in the Gospels and 111 times in the Epistles. Now, when looking at Scripture, we can see that the term Ecclesia was used to bring designation to a local assembly or gathering of followers of Jesus. We see churches in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Acts chapter 11, verse 22, Asia Minor, Acts chapter 16, verse 5, Rome, Romans chapter 16, verse 5, Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 1, Galatia, Galatians chapter 1, verse 2, Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, and the home of Philemon, Philemon chapter 2. And many other locations where we see the church being birthed and planted across history. Now, according to the second Helvet, Helvet, I hate this word, <laughs> Helvetic confession, the church is a company of the faithful, I love this definition, called and gathered out of the world, a communion of all saints, that is, of them who truly know and rightly worship and serve the true God. In Jesus Christ, the Savior, by the word of the Holy Spirit, and who by faith are partakers of all those good graces which are freely offered through Christ. What a beautiful statement. Theologian Lewis Burkhoff writes this in his work, Systematic Theology. The church forms a spiritual unity of which Christ is the divine head. It is animated by one spirit, the spirit of Christ. It professes one faith, shares one hope and serves one king. It is the citadel of the truth and God's agency in communicating to believers all spiritual blessings. Now, remember, if you're new to this series, we take a little bit of time on the front side just to do a quick academic run through of each of these topics that we're discussing. But I really appreciate this summation of the church from the authors of the great doctrines of the Bible. The church is composed of the body of believers who have been called out from the world and who are under the dominion and the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, all of these ideas are highlighted As Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter four, verses one to six, he says this, therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience. Listen to these words, listen to the, listen to the idea that's behind this thing called church, gentleness, humility, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to be one, uh, you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. This is why we've got to read our Bibles, church. Now, once again, there's so much territory that we could cover regarding the discovery and the study of the church, a theological study known as Ecclesiology, which simply means the study of the nature of the church, things pertaining to the church, its ordinances, governance, role, and mission within the kingdom of God. And there's so much one can learn from a historical and theological study of the church. But for today's purposes, I really want to focus the remainder of our time on four images that we are given in scripture concerning the church and the implications that these truths have us have on us individually and corporately. Now, some of you are wondering, did we just get to points this fast? <laughs> no, I've got some more I wanna say before we get to the points. I'm just teasing. 
So we're gonna look at four images today that we see scripturally concerning the church. But before looking at these images, I wanna make a very important acknowledgement about the church. Now, everybody help me out. Auditorium one, auditorium two, online today. Are we all very clear as to what I'm talking about when I say the church? Okay, so we're talking about the universal church, but we're also talking about the local church this morning. And I want us, it's easy for us to think about the universal church, but this stuff really fleshes itself out. Come on, how many of you know this? Within the local church. Because you've never been offended by your brother in China. Come on, somebody, right? You've never had to work out the gospel with your sister because of a small group issue in New Jersey. Come on, it's getting quiet in church today. Come on, where do you got to work these things out? With that person that's bothering you in the local church. So a lot of our direct line of sight today is on the local church. So before we get to these four images, I want to make an important acknowledgement. I was recently introduced to a fascinating word while tasting chocolates in the middle of a botanical garden with our family on vacation. It was a word that when I heard it stuck with me. If I'm honest with you in settings like this, I have a tendency to wander off and think about other things. And this lady was talking and I wasn't listening and I'm paying attention to my kids and I had chocolate in my hand so I could care less what she was saying. And I was just eating chocolate. Justice was sitting next to me. He's like, can we just eat it now? And I was like, sure, shove it all in, go for it. (laughs) But then this lady said something in the middle of her conversation talking about all the stuff concerning chocolate and She said this, this word, and it stuck with me. The word is terroir. Now, this is a French word, and some of you who are fluent in French or know French can say this a lot better. Apparently, you're supposed to hack with your throat when you say this. I'm not going to do that. I got to do three services today, okay? (laughs) Terroir. And at least from what research has pointed out, this word finds its origin in wine production, but is used for its definition in the production of coffee and chocolate as well. The French... This being a French word, they apply it to food. The word terroir at its most basic meaning in English, listen to this, means soil. According to one writer, its practical meaning goes well beyond any one word definition. Terroir is not not soil of, of the kind you transfer from plastic bag to flower pot. Listen to this. It is rather the unique soil and situation of a specific place. The idea behind the word terroir is that the grapes for wine, the beans for coffee, or the fruit for chocolate is defined by the soil that it has been growing in. For the French and many others, terroir means, listen to this, I love this, the taste of the place. So when you have wine or when you have chocolate or when you have coffee, you're not just having wine, chocolate, or coffee or food. You're tasting the soil of the place that it was raised in. This is the idea that the product, whether wine, coffee, or chocolate, its identity is formed because of the soil that it was raised in, among other contributing factors. What has happened within the Western and more specifically the American church, due large in part to what has been called the seeker movement, is that the terroir has been tampered with. We have lost most of the distinctiveness distinctiveness of who we have been designed to be by God. And in this, we have not been what people need the church to be. To reach people, whether the motivation has been positive or not, to reach people, we softened, relegated, and all but worked to hide many of the things that make the church distinctive, including our beliefs. Everybody shout terroir. In his book, Bullies and Saints, author John Dixon comments on this issue as he writes this. Listen to these words. Christianity's cultural flexibility can, as I say, leave it vulnerable to modification. In seeking to accommodate itself to a local setting, it can compromise its own moral logic. He then writes this most powerful observation. Christians are prone to adopting local norms and accommodating themselves to the local context. The capacity and desire to fit in to a host culture makes them susceptible to the temptation to sacrifice some of their own ideals in an effort to win friends and influence people. 
When I lived in Australia for a few years, some of the most popular sports were rugby and cricket. <clears throat> and to be honest, I never really got into them, right? I loved me some American football, which is soccer in those places, which I didn't then understand. And I was like, well, soccer's dumb. I say that as an illustration. So I never really got into cricket and, and, and rugby. But what I didn't do was try to change them or make them adjust to the sport, adjust their sport to accommodate my dislike. Could you imagine what that would look like? Me walking into a rugby match or a test match for cricket and saying to them, hey, I don't really understand all that goes into this. I don't particularly care for the rules that you've established. I don't like the names that you use and your outfits do not make sense to me. Can we change some things in this place? Come on, show of hands. How many of you would say that is ridiculous? What would they say to me? They're like, we don't care. Right? Now I know for some of you, this is gonna be a, a message that you're gonna have to really struggle with. But this is what has happened in the church. And to be honest, the church, the church acquiesced in a lot of ways. These images of the church that are presented to us in scripture are the terroir of the church. They provide us with the framework for church life and identity. This would be Paul's point as he writes to young Timothy in chapter three of his first letter to Timothy, verses 14 to 15, listen to what he writes. He says, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. So, so Paul's trying to get to Timothy. He wants to be with Timothy. He wants to hang out with Timothy but his journeys are gonna be sidelined and there's gonna be some trouble along the way. So he says this, but if I, if I should be delayed, I've written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So with the remainder of our time today, let's look at these four images presented to us in scripture. Y'all with me today? Yes. Come on, auditorium one, you with me? Yes. Auditorium two, you still with me? Yes. All right, here's the first one. Every shot number one. First thing that we see in scripture, the first image is the church as a family. The church as a family. Back to Ephesians chapter two, verses 19 to 22. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's, come on, someone shout household. household. Oh, come on, someone shout household. household. So we're members of his <clears throat> household. See, the image of a household and family speaks to this issue right here, identity and security. Identity and security. Listen to what Paul writes to the Romans in chapter eight, verses 14 to 17. For all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. For you did not, oh, this scripture's so good. Ah. Oh. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself testifies together that with our spirit, that we are God, someone shout children. children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. <clears throat> Paul would write a similar thought with a similar language in Galatians chapter four, verses four to seven. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then God has made you an heir. Yes. My kids, whenever they walk in to this place, whether right or wrong, they have a tendency to act like they own it. And it's really funny to watch. They think they can go all the places and we're like, guys, the rules apply to you as well. They think they can take all the things, they think they can do all the stuff because they're a pastor's kid. So they, they, they live and operate in a certain way. They have a confidence that's about them. And what we see in scripture and what I find fascinating is that as we say yes to Jesus, you and I are made sons and daughters. 
yet we still live like slaves. But more importantly, this is what's fascinating to me, is that in sons and daughters of most of the people that I see, the people that have the greatest contempt for the household are sons and daughters. Wow. Because the first, the first thing that, that the Bible shows us is the church is a, is a family. This is God's household. The promises of God, the power of God, the presence of God, the security found in God are for those who are sons and daughters adopted because of the paid sacrifice of Jesus and gifted to us through faith in Christ. This is known as salvation. C.S. Lewis said to be a son of God means that you have been brought into the family of God and you are loved and cared for by the father. This is what we see in John chapter one, verses 10 to 13. <clears throat> he was in the world and the world was created through him. And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but born of God. Can someone say amen this morning? Amen. See, the idea of family contained within it is this doctrine of adoption. I highlighted this a few, a few weeks ago. It's an important aspect of this image we see in scripture of the church as a family. But here's what I wanna to say to us this morning about this issue. We must be careful not to draft our worldly experience and idea of family onto the church family. Because the head of this household is Jesus and he is perfect. Now the house is not always perfect because within that house, come on somebody, is you and me and us. And how many of you know, even at our own homes, the best that we try to run them, it gets a little wild and out sometimes. Come on, how many of you know, the siblings bicker a little bit. Things don't happen the way that we want to. We don't have everything that we need all the time. Things get a little funky sometimes, but at the end of the day, we still don't dump on the house. So much our family. Now remember my job today, is to hopefully instill once again, a love for the church. And some of you will struggle with that. I'm not saying accept that it's perfect. That's not what I'm saying. Please don't hear something wrong. We can look at it. I'm actually one of the greatest critiquers of the church, but I can be, because I'm greatly involved in it. Yep. Yep. But what we don't need is people who aren't involved in the house, critiquing from the sidelines, yep. right? I love, football season's around the, around the corner, guys. Come on, how many of you are looking forward to football season? Okay, five of you. We don't have any football fans in here. Fantastic. <laughs> You'll all be at church during the football season. It'll be great. <laughs> but what I find fascinating about football or any other sport is the amount of us who sit on the sidelines or in the stands and make all the commentary we want to about the coaches and the players and what they should do, as if we know. Right. There's a reason you are not a coach. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is the head of this household. This family has order. It has discipline. It has love. It has mutual respect. Come on, and the house has chores. Uh-oh, getting quiet across the room today. We serve. We give. Yesterday, we had over 300 plus people here serving our community to the other. Come on, all across, all, all across the place. We, we serve, we get involved. That's why we talk about teams around here. It's not just so we can get another person on a team. It's actually because we want you to engage as a son and daughter. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, get involved. Come on, help move the mission forward. This is why we give because it's your house, right? This is why we do what it is that we do. These are important things. That's why we have mutual respect for each other. This is why the church, because it's a family of adopted kids, this is why the church must look different. Yes. Yes. It must look different. Good. We've said this before and I'll say it again. Eric and I, when we first planted this church with the team, we decided and we prayed. I said, oh God, please do not let this be an all white church. I don't want it. Plus that church gets really, really still, okay? <laughs> 
I'm going to offend so many people this morning. It's going to be fantastic. But you know what I love that's happening in this church? Is that we're seeing the diversity that a lot of people don't see in our state. It's here. Oh God, give us a house that looks like the various types of adopted sons and daughters across this state. Come on, somebody. I love it. It's not a perfect family, but it is a family deeply rooted in the grace of God and called to see more sons and daughters equipped and mature in their faith. Every shot number two. The church, the second image that we see is the church as a body. Family, now body. They have different realities associated with them. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. For just as the body is one and has many parts and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. Now, through verses 14 to 26, Paul's gonna continue on with this analogy. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna read all that, but I wanna highlight now verse 27. At the end of this thought process he has, listen to what he says. First Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Yeah. Good. Now, when Paul speaks to the image of the church as a body contained within this is the idea of unity, function, and stability. To be in the body is to play a part in the body. Now, I wanna say this really strong today. Paul and the first century church had no framework for spectator Christianity. The only framework that they had was all in Christianity. Why? The stakes were too high. There's that fly again. <laughs> if y'all see me getting fidgety, that's the fly, not weirdness, okay. The stakes were too high. The, the, the territory was too dangerous. The odds were against them, but they had God and they had each other. The church as a body is an incredibly potent image because of the inherent meaning Paul, spirit-led in his writing, has in his mind, along with his knowledge of the short history of the church. Watch, watch what Paul had in his mind because he watched and was persecuting the very thing that he was now building. Acts chapter two, verses 41 to 47. So those who accepted his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. Can we just stop there for a second? Can we never, like, can we stop with the argument that big church and small church are against each other? We see small churches in the Bible and we see big churches in the Bible. Small churches are not bad. Small churches are not good. <laughs> big churches are not bad. Big churches are not good. Bad churches are bad. And good churches are good. Come on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Pastor Seth and Kaisa for a second, okay? I love these two so much. Uh, Pastor Seth and Pastor Kaisa, they have one child in their family. Okay? My niece, Hannah, she's amazing. But how many of you know it would be absolutely ludicrous to say to them, because, you have one, because you're a small family, you're a bad family, wow. or a good family. What would you say? You're a small family. Now, in that small family, Hannah's gonna have a different experience because of the size of that family, but it's not inherently bad or good. Y'all see what I'm talking about? What Seth and Kaisa do can be inherently bad or good, but they're amazing parents. So they have a great family, just a small family. Alicia comes from a family of nine, 11. Where did two more pop out? Like, is this recent? Okay, um, she's my sister-in-law, 11. 11, now how many of you know, you wouldn't go to Alicia and be like, oh, you have a, church, you have a family of 11. This is a bad family. <laughs> Your parent, way too many, way too many kids in that family. This is good. Are you, you guys tracking what I'm talking about here? It's amazing what we come up with sometimes to create arguments that don't make sense. No, now in her family of 11, because I know the family, things were structured very differently. Yep. Okay. 
And the kids had to negotiate things differently. And some of the kids were closer to other kids because of the age reign. And some other kids were not because they were younger. And they all integrated with dad and mom a little bit differently. And they had a farm and they baked bread and they did all of those things. <laughs> okay. What, I, what I'm trying to do is I want us to see the, the logical fallacies that we create sometimes right, right. that don't make sense. Bad churches are bad and good churches are good. Yeah but size doesn't matter. Right. Everybody is different. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yeah. That was not in my notes, but there you go. <laughs> so 3,000 were added that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. Every day, the, every day, every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Yeah. Yet for many of us, we are simply okay with the church just being a location that we show up to rather than a body we are a part of. Wow. Wow. This is why we can jump in and out of churches so easy. It's because for many of us in our Western context, it's a location, not a body. But the picture that Paul's gonna give us is that if one of the body parts tries to remove itself, it hurts. We're okay with the church being an event on Sunday rather than a body that we care for. We're okay with the idea of being unknown and anonymous rather than a living and active part of the body. Jesus, the disciples, Paul, the apostles would have no framework for much of the modern apathy that is associated with those who would profess to be followers of Jesus and subsequently a part of the body. Rod Dreyer writes in his book, The Benedict Option, to be part of a community is to share in its life. That inevitably makes demands on the individual that limits his freedom. He continues by saying that consumerist approach to the community of believers reproduces the fragmentation that is shattering Christianity in the contemporary world. Community life, not a dreamy ideal, said Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is an often difficult initiation into the divine reality. Now, there was an article that I just read recently called The Misunderstood Reasons Millions of Americans Stop Going to Church. Um, by a man named Jake Medor. And the question that he wrestled with is a fascinating question that he came through through different various ways of studying and some um, research that was done. And this was his question. What if the problem isn't that churches are asking too much of their members, but what if they aren't asking nearly enough? Yeah. And this is a fascinating question to me. In other words, is the body expecting far too little from the body? Are we not providing the necessary vision or clarity needed for the body to run the way that it needs to run? Yeah. I got a 13 year old boy right now and I have to send him out with the dog and tell them both run. <laughs> Why? Because they got to get their energy out. Y'all with me? Yeah. That kid jumps on the trampoline almost all day long. Why? Because he's a 13 year old boy. His bo he, he has so much energy inside of him. And how many of you know that I would damage him if I told him just to sit on the couch all day long? Is that what we're doing to our churches? Wow. Huh. Wow. That it's actually built to do something. Come on, somebody. It's, it's built in such a way. You got to run your energy out, church. Yeah. That's what Sunday morning is about. As we get in here and it's like, come on, let's do it. We're going to worship and we're going to praise and we're going to get in his word and then we're going to be equipped. And then it's like, get outside and run the energy off. Yeah. Reach people, find people, love people, serve people, do make a mark in our city. In a very pointed but sobering moment in the article, Jake writes this. He says, the problem is that many Americans have adopted a way of life that has left us lonely, anxious, and uncertain of how to live in community with other people. The tragedy of American churches is that they have been so caught up in the same world that they now find they have nothing to offering these suffering people that can't be more easily found somewhere else. American churches have too often been content to function as a kind of vaguely spiritual NGO 
an organization of detached individuals who meet together for religious services that inspire them, provide practical life advice, or offer positive emotional experiences. Too often, it has not been a community that, the, that through its preaching and living bears witness to another way to live. Wow. Someone shout the church. church. Number three, I'm gonna burn through these last, these last two, okay? The third image we see is the church is a temple. Church is a temple. First Corinthians chapter three, verses 10 to 17. According to God's grace that was given to me, I've laid a found, this is Paul speaking, I've laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, another builds on it, but each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. Come on, somebody. What is that foundation? He says it, it's Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss. He himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Don't you, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the spirit of God lives in you? Now, in this unique moment, Paul is speaking to the collective church. He's writing a letter to the Corinthians. Later on, in chapter six of Corinthians, he's gonna be speaking to the individual, each of us as being an individual temple of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna talk about that in the next few weeks. This is what I want us to see with the temple issue. The temple issue is an issue of foundation, construction, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. One of the non-negotiables about this church, the well, is that we desire to be a presence-saturated church. Yep. Yeah. Yep. One of the things that we said is that we don't want anything not to have the presence of God in it. This is why we won't debate about worship around here. Right. This is why we will not debate about preaching his word around here because this is where the presence of God shows up. Yeah. Come on, y'all with me? Yeah. Now we've said this before, you can experience the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in all kinds of different places and spaces, but there is a unique reality when the church Sons and daughters, come on somebody, comes together and worships. Comes together to receive instruction from God's word. There is a different thing that happens than what I experience through the power and spirit and presence of God in my individual life. Number four, but shout number four. <sighs> we kind of did it. Here's the fourth image. The church as a bride. Now, when I read this next section of scripture, don't get lost in the wives and husbands issue because some of you are gonna freak out and not pay attention to me anymore, okay? Paul is intermixing thoughts here. We're gonna actually talk about this scripture again later on, okay? But there's a lot, lot to unpack here, but just listen to what Paul's driving in. Ephesians 5, 22 through to 33. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. See, just keep listening, keep listening. <laughs> because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave him, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy <clears throat> and blameless. In the same way, <clears throat> excuse me, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hates his own flesh. This whole thing of hating on churches, it's gotta stop. Yep. If any of you are like, hey, Jason, I really wanna be your friend. <clears throat> I wanna hang out with you. I'd love to spend some time with you. Maybe we do a Bible study and pray together. Let's go get coffee. I mean, that, that sounds awesome. But I gotta let you know something. I hate your wife. How many of you would be like, how many of you know? I'd be like, yeah, probably not gonna happen. <laughs> I use a gross analogy to see how we engage sometimes. Yeah. Oh, I love Jesus. I just don't like his church. Wow. <laughs> I love, I, I, Jesus is awesome, but his wife, ugh. His bride, you mean the thing that he died for? 
You mean that thing? <laughs> Some of you don't like this today. <laughs> For this reason, a man will leave his father, mother be joined to his wife, the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. This is what Paul says. To sum it up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, the wife is to respect her husband. I want us to realize something because the church is more than a building. Jesus didn't die for brick and mortar. He died for you and me. So when we take issue of, with the church, you're not taking issue with brick and mortar. You're taking issue with Devon and with Dr. Lori and with Howie and with the neighbor next to you. Why? Because we are sons and daughters that can prize this thing known as the bride of Christ. Now, some of us are gonna have to wrestle with this message. And I know what's going on right now, but what about, what about, what about, what about, do you know Jesus knows about all the whatabouts? And he's gonna have some things to say to the church, for sure. Go read Revelation. He had some things to say to the church. But I want us to know today that you and I as sons and daughters, for those of us who profess faith in Jesus, we belong to a family. We are a part of a body. We experience his presence in the temple. And this is the bride that he died for. And there may be some of us in here today who have yet to acknowledge the fact that he died for you as well. And he's saying, Jesus is saying to you today, come home, come home. Let's do this thing called life and faith together. Every head bowed, every eye closed today. Jesus, we love you. For some of us in this room today, this is a very important moment. This is a moment where you get to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you haven't done that before. And I know this is a different type of message because we're talking about the church, but I just, I want us to see that Jesus died for you and me collectively. And if you've yet to say yes to him, come on, make this your moment. We're gonna pray a prayer today. Nothing fancy in the words, but rather the heart from which these words come. And if you're, if you're like, man, Jason, that's me. I need to say yes to Jesus. Make this your prayer today. Come on, as loud as we possibly can. Auditorium one, auditorium two. Would you all pray this after me? Everybody say, Jesus. Jesus. I'm giving you everything. I'm giving, you everything. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving, you my past. I'm giving you my right now. And I'm putting my future in your hands. Save me, change me, and make me new. And I declare in this moment that I'm gonna follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name.